G'day and welcome to the Noob Sparrow Podcast. I'm your host, Turbo, flying solo yet again without my good mate and anchorman, Shrek, who is still away in China. Now, are you a passionate Spiro looking to get better at spearfishing? Well, you have come to the right place. Every fortnight, we interview one of the world's best Spiros and we probe them for all their tips, tricks and knowledge to help us all become better, safer, more sustainable and more effective Spiros. And this week is no different. This week we're speaking with Anthony Judge. Now, Ant Judge, as he's better known, is an absolutely extraordinary freediver. He's a freediving free diving instructor and a passionate Spiro. And uh, he is here on the east coast of Australia, but he's speared all around the world. He's chased many, many different species. And today we talk to Ant all about... Uh, free diving training and how it can impact your spear, spear fishing. And he also talks about some of his memorable catches, which are absolutely phenomenal and some great stories in there as well. Now, before we get stuck into it, let's. Uh, I've got a few shout outs uh, for a few people out there on the worldwide, the www.interwebs. So I'd just like to read out a couple of reviews for the podcast. Um, up on iTunes. Thank you guys so much for reviewing us. We love it. This one's from Kiju11. Uh, listening to these guys has already saved me hundreds of dollars by not jumping in the water dressed up like a Christmas tree. Forget what episode that is. That's one of the early ones. I think that was a New Zealand one. Anyway, it's great to listen to the people who are passionate about what they're talking about and the talks make it so much more interesting. So Kiju11, thank you so much for your review. And I particularly like this one. This one's from the US from from Vampire, also known as Sebastian. So perhaps Sebastian the Vampire, I don't know. Anyway, have been listening to Turbo and Shrek for a while now, and those weirdos make me come back every time for more. Even though I'm located in Southern California, I guess I'm stoked to hear how people catch their fish all over the world. Keep it coming, boys. Sebastian. Yeah, Sebastian, thank you for your review, and we will try to get uh, more Californians on the show and uh, hopefully get a little bit more information coming your way from your local area. So thank you for that review as well. I think there's another one here. It's an absolute uh, beauty. Sven Franklin book review. I like this one. Such an easy read. All the tips are nice, short, and easy to get your head around. Perching this book, you are being rewarded with the tricks and tips that these guys have acquired over years, and they really go the distance. A must read for anyone in the sport, and this should almost be a prerequisite for anyone who wants to be a good dive buddy. A few tips that I made a conscious effort of doing, and they have paid off big time. Also, check out Shrek and Turbo's podcast, noobspiro.com. He actually spelt the dot D-A-T. Love that. Won't let me post the URL. Ah, right. That's why I did that. For a, for a good laugh and even more tips when you could shake, then you could shake a stick at. That's absolutely excellent. So uh, thanks, Fen. Loving that. A prerequisite. So for everyone else out there, the book should be a prerequisite. So get into it. It's a good little read. Hard copy still on the way. Working away on that. We don't work quickly, we but we do work. So that's absolutely excellent, guys. Thanks for the reviews. Thanks for all the guys on the uh, Noob Spiro private Facebook group. So if you're on the uh, part of the, the Noob Spiro floater, you can also get onto the uh, closed group there for Noob Spiro. And it's a bunch of noobs in there. You can ask all the questions you like and uh, we'll get them answered for you without any sort of fear of looking embarrassed. So uh, get on there and join that as well. Now, I think that's enough from me. We'll throw it over to Shrek the Anchorman and all these insightful questions and philosophical views on spearfishing that we've all come to love. And I uh, might even take the piss out of him in this one about eating KFC, as I usually do. I love doing that. So uh, enjoy. This is Ant Judge, Shrek and myself. G'day guys, thanks for listening to the Noob Spiro podcast today and joining the illustrious Turbo and I. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to save money on spearfishing equipment. When I want to buy a spear gun, there's nothing I like better than saving $20. That's right, you can use the code NoobSpiro at spearfishing.com.au to save $20 on all purchases over $200. You can also visit Adreno in their physical stores in Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane. Check out a huge range of equipment and get advice from more than 60 underwater equipment experts. That's right, support the Noob Spiro podcast by shopping with our sponsor, spearfishing.com.au. And thank you for joining us today. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is also proudly brought to you in partnership with penetratorfins.com. Get on there, guys. Have a look at some of the designs they've got. They've got clears. The blacks are beautiful. Check out the Noob Spiro custom Oki print. 
it's mad as well. Larry's got a full range of wicker designs and he's got beautiful finish on his fins. He's uh, recently updated his manufacturing process. It's even better than it was before. He makes some of the best fins in the world. Uh, he offers a full international warranty along with $25 flat rate shipping worldwide. And uh, to, to make that offer even sweeter, pump in the code Noob Spiro at checkout and save another 20 bucks. Penetratorfins.com. Support the Noob Spiro podcast by shopping with our sponsor. So, g'day, Noobers. Welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. You're joining Turbo and I today as we chat with Ant Judge. Uh, Ant's a freediving instructor that ranges up and down mostly the east coast of Australia, but he's he's fairly widely travelled and uh, he's got a, a wealth of knowledge. And we're hopefully going to dig in with that. Uh, it's at, at, in the particularly in the veterans vault today. So welcome to the show, Ant. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely pumped to get on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Is that sarcasm? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm no. Uh, it's, it's great. I've been looking forward to this for so long. The moment you mentioned it, I was like, yeah. And like we missed our um, interview last week. I was like pretty devastated. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's yeah. good to have you on, man. Um, we've we've had a lot to do with your dad. I mean, we were talking before the show, we've had a lot to do with your dad, Wayne. Uh, uh, Turbo was saying, you know, like our whole dive crew pretty much met through a training squad that your father ran. Yep. And, uh, and and Wayne works up here at our major sponsors um, shop at Adreno Spearfishing. Yep. So um, we've, we've, we've had a lot of ties. It's funny, we've never really uh, met or chat much over the, over the last few yeah, years. Yeah, so. I know. Well, it's amazing just how fast the sport's like growing like that as well. You know, there's so many new faces, new names and I mean, it's like, I, I love it. I think it's awesome. We're just seeing the expansion like that. So, yeah, yeah. All right. So for, for the benefit of us and our listeners, how, how did you get started spearfishing? Uh, where, where was it? And what, what was your experience like? Oh, mate, my, um, my first time spearfishing was like pretty much when I was four years old, I was hand spearing mullet in the Bondi, North Bondi rock pool. That was, <laughs> that was pretty much where it come from. Um, then, uh, my dad was already spearfishing and we used to, I used to hold onto his shoulders and he would go out off North Bondi and rain hell on Red Mowong and whatever else was unlucky <laughs> enough to swim in front of him. Um, <laughs> but yeah, since then, like I just always loved it, always loved being in the water, um, yeah. you know, and it was probably, uh, would have been probably 17 or 18 when I first saw a, uh, a magazine article with Terry Mars in it uh, holding up Wahoo and that was it. The moment I saw that photo, I just knew what I wanted to do and uh, off I went down that track. I went and put three rubbers on my sea hornet, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys laugh like I'm joking. No, I'm serious. As <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, that wow. thing was the most inaccurate gun. Like, like oh, after yeah. you put three rubbers, and they're all smaller, one size smaller than they're supposed to be as well. It never Shoot around corners, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's where it come from, and that was where it just just grew from there. And yeah, it's just kind of, it's taken me around the world now and I, I absolutely love it. It's like my passion. I mean, even though I teach free diving, I also teach like all spearfishing sides as well. But, um, you know, whenever it's my own time, I just jump in the water and go for a spear. So, All right. It sounds like you're pretty spoiled, to be honest, getting started. You, you, your dad had you out on his back at four years old. Yep. Um, can, you, can you remember if you had any obstacles? I mean, what did you have trouble with when you got started? Um, man, probably the usual stuff. I mean, I was a kid. Like, you know, obviously pretty small when I was four. And um, I remember watching uh, my dad diving and getting through. Like, I remember this one swim through at South Bondi, and it's probably six meters. And by then, I was probably six years old or something. And there was two sides. One is I was like, absolutely, like, I was actually scared to swim through the actual cave, which is funny because yeah. later on in life, doing swim throughs in deep water is one of the things that gives me the biggest buzzes. You know, I love doing <laughs> doing swim through of wrecks and things like that. But, um, yeah, but yeah, also equalizing. Like when I was a kid, I, you know, I remember that day I was, I was learning to equalize when I was about six and, you know, the pain. I remember that. But, um, but yeah, no, like honestly, I, I, one is my dad's an awesome teacher and, um, Yep. You know, he's very like uh, just brought me up around the water and just I don't know, I've just never. It's always seemed to be pretty natural in the water now. So, yeah. I remember chat, chatting with Wayne and we were talking about equalising. We were talking about changing from friends uh, from Val Salva to friends. Yep. And for me, I don't even remember consciously planning to do Val Salva. I just just started doing it in uh, in diving pools swimming in New Zealand. Yep. Is is that how much uh, how you learnt, or did your dad sort of walk you through? Um, you know, how, how to sort of cl close your throat or whatever. Yeah, the epiglottis. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, definitely. I started doing Valsalva and then um, developed in the friends when I was spearfishing a lot. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I definitely heard mention of it and he would have, he definitely was the one that was telling me about it. Like, oh no, no, he's not blowing, you know, with his lungs, he's, he's using his tongue as a piston. And, but like back then, like, you know, this is, this is a long time ago now, there wasn't a lot of information available to anybody. I mean, there was a few books that you could read, but you know, the internet wasn't even like up and really running yet. You know, no one really, there was almost no way of sharing information. So things are really slow back then and, Having yeah. to actually read books and to to learn <laughs> stuff is crazy, but you know, I mean, I think divers nowadays, and not just divers, but anyone's very spoiled the fact that they can jump on their iPhone and pretty much Google the most advanced ways of equalizing the world and a program to learn it. It's pretty pretty awesome. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you had an early mentor in your dad. Um, yeah. Did you have any other mentors growing up? You you were part of a, a big spearfishing club culture down there as well, I believe. Yeah, definitely, and um, that was really what shaped like the direction I went in my spearfishing for sure. Um, you know, I'm still like really, really enjoy my involvement in clubs. I think for new guys starting out, I think the, the best thing to do is go and find a club because, um, you know, without it, there's a lot of, you know, cowboys and blind leading the blind. And, um, you know, in the club you get to dive with like, for me, I mean, I was part of an offshore underwater club and straight away I was, you know, diving with guys like Ted Lauer and, you know, he's been diving, I don't know, 50-odd years, you know. So that kind of experience when you, you just have to watch guys like that in the water and the amount of stuff you pick up um, in a short term, like short time, is just amazing. So, yeah, mm -hmm. guys like that I owe a lot of credit to. And um, Arthur, Arthur Mensdorf, I used to dive with him, and he was kind of the one that opened my eyes to deep spearfishing. He had done a lot of diving in the med, and for him he was, you know, pretty comfortable diving in the 30s and, so um, I started watching that and started going out spearing with him and, like, you know, watching what the difference was between him and the average diver and, you know, learning a bit of technique off him. And so, yeah, I had definitely those two guys I put a, I put a lot down to. And But then the crew I used to dive with, man, all the North Shore Young Guns, I don't know if you guys remember all that phase. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you guys had cool tats on oh, your yeah, yeah, lap. Right? So. <laughs> it, was, it was an awesome time, man. It's honestly an awesome time in spearfishing. I mean, it was yeah. – the start of pretty much social media and YouTube, and we all had MySpaces. And uh, <laughs> I remember yeah. I paid a thousand dollars for a, uh, a Sony CyberShot 4.1 megapixel camera. <laughs> 4.1 yeah, megapixel. Yeah. It was like it was like the the bomb back then. And yeah, you yeah. know, we just used to all carry butt bags of a camera in it and film. You know, like dive diving. But that was what's like. You know, all of a sudden there started to be videos up about coral sea trips and you know spearing yeah, yeah. doggies and just watching watching it go from there was just unreal. So. I've seen some photos of you uh, with Dogtooth Tuna. You've 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 speared all over the world, and um, can, whereabouts have you sort of ranged to? Oh, I'm curious to sort of know. Oh, mate, definitely. There's definitely lots of parts I haven't got to, which is definitely on my to-do list. But um, and obviously I've been for New Zealand. I speared a lot of Australia, uh, all for, like up for Indonesia. Um, a lot of time in Hawaii. I used to live in Hawaii for a bit, which is awesome. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, and then um, speared off little islands off Italy and around Italy, so island of Alba. And, oh, wow. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been, it's been unreal. It's, I think that's um, one of the coolest things about our sport is we get to go to some of the most awesome locations in the world and, you know, chase down dinner. So. Yeah, certainly given Turbo and I a taste for it recently, we've had some um, some real vagabonding spear Spiros on the show. We've had uh, Adventure Man Dan, yep. Kimmy Werner, some of these people that have just been everywhere and, you know, done a whole lot of stuff that's just cool. As yeah. And, uh, oh, Kimmy, um, Kimmy Werner, she's awesome. I met her in Hawaii when I was over there and uh, she's one of the person I, like, in the world I just give a lot of respect to. She's All the different paths she chooses to go down just seems to be inspiring. So she's, she's an yeah, awesome yeah. chick. Yeah. She was cool to chat with. And uh, all right, so when you were in Italy, did you get to dive with some of the uh, Italian guns? Not really, eh? Um, I wish I did. Uh, it was kind of almost a surprise visit. I just kind of went, that's it, I'm going. And, um, <laughs> you know, packed, up, packed some of my stuff and went over there. And um, I was just like, my ex girlfriend was over there at the time and, uh, you know, hung out with her. And she, she was uh, like a fin swimmer. So we ended up, you know, spending a fair bit of time in the ocean. And, but there, it was definitely different spearing. Like it's really, really different spearfishing over there. It's it is pretty cool, um, but there's there's only two ways that seem to work over there. Really, really good snooping, like really quiet and following shadow lines, and um, you know, like being very precise about all your movements, not to bang anything. And occasionally you'll stumble across a fish feeding up in the shallows. 
Otherwise, it's deep spear fishing, and um, you've got to be prepared to dive pretty deep over there. So, but, um, mm. yeah, it was really good, but not nice water. I mean, we're diving like Alba was amazing, like you know, 30, 30 centimeters viz, only slight currents, you know, uh-huh. yeah, those dentex, like the pretty much the um, the snapper of the Mediterranean. They're, yeah. they're amazing looking fish, and yeah, they 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 were awesome to chase. So. Did you did you did you get a few good dentex while you were there? Mate, I didn't get a single one, and I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> Love the honesty. Yeah, it was. I was fearing hard for them, and I only really found them in one spot, and um, it was like super deep, like a bit a bit over forty meters, and wow. um, no coverage at all. I was pretty much just laying in this little weed bed, and the weeds about one hundred and fifty mil, mil, mil long, and I'm trying to cover myself in sand and get them interested in me, and but they were. They were coming probably about five meters from me, but I was only sporting a 1.1 and um, just didn't quite have the range to pop one off. But they were good fish, like up around seven kilos or something. And, wow. But um, yeah, I shot a few of the other species over there and like all the yeah. kind of brim and tar wine looking things. And you know, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, they all look similar, but not quite the same. But yeah, they're, yeah, 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 a yeah. lot of fun still. But um, oh, cool. Yeah, good. All right, well, next part, next part of the show, I mean, it's strangely related. Um, it's a memorable fish story. I mean, You've you've shot plenty plenty of them over the years, but what's sort of one that really stands out for you? Oh man, so many cool fish that like I just stick in my mind. But um, probably probably the one that really kind of was a culmination of team effort and time in the water and all the kind of things going the right way was um, the sailfish that I got out in the Coral Sea one year. And, okay. Um, you know, I think you know a lot of people were getting their first billfish is pretty special and this was definitely that like i really wanted a billfish and i uh, was paying a lot of money to do coral sea trips and you know just when everything comes together it, you know it's one of those special special moments and it was actually a pretty cool story if you i'll, I'll go through if you guys don't mind to hear yeah. about it. it's a bit of a laugh uh the reef had really shut down it was definitely on the um the, the wrong side of the feeding and everything was getting really quiet and um it was i think we only had one or two days left in the trip so we we're all kind of taking it easy and but People were driving around, coming up to us, going, you guys see anything? And we hadn't seen anything. They hadn't seen anything. And we just come across a current line on the backside of this reef and um, jumped in there. And, like, honestly, we didn't see anything for hours. There's not nothing, like no sharks, anything. But we're just – no one else was seeing anything. So we just thought we'll just keep drifting down this current line. And um, we'd probably spent two hours just drifting, rotating boaties. And and then um, everyone was just getting fed up. They're going, oh, this stuff, let's go back to the boat and just drink. And um, – <laughs> And I'm like, oh, let's, you know, give it a few minutes and I uh, couldn't believe it. They, everyone's gone up. They're packing it in. They're all climbing on the boat and I've still got my <laughs> teasers down and um, I just remember this this black shape swimming in, you know, and a sailfish, even though like this was a 40 kilo fish, but they're still like, you know, three meters long pretty much. They're a monstrous fish, like in length. Yeah. And it just comes in just jet black and just comes straight up to my teasers I look around, there's no one else in the water. They're all actually getting on the boat at that time. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be joking. And um, so I dive and on the way down, uh, the sailfish is just doing a slow lap around my teasers. I just like, like wiggle my teasers slightly. And um, watching this thing light up, go from pitch black to purple and iridescence. And oh, uh, yeah, it was one of those things. I wish we had the GoPros and the video technology we had nowadays uh, to catch it. But, you know, and then... You know, when everything comes together, like I've done a lot of time testing my gun and shooting my gun, and I just then I, I always pretty much just use a 1.4, um, you know, Euro style kind of gun, even the Coral Sea. I find getting close to fishes and being super accurate is more important than having stacks of power. So, um, but watching this fish, he rolls over to have a look at me and pulled the trigger and just stoned him. And, um, yeah, oh, wicked. yeah it was awesome, man. I, like, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I um, tugged on the string to make sure he was stoned, and yeah, he's. <laughs> Didn't, didn't flicker and um, oh, oh, I couldn't wow. believe it. I swim back up the surface. I remember looking up at the tinny directly above me and I can still see the fins in the water, like hanging in the water, everyone else getting on board. And, <laughs> and um, I'm like, oh, no way. And I'm screaming underwater. I nearly blacked out because I was like screaming so loud underwater. And uh, even though it was like a 10 second dive, it was really easy. And uh, swim up to the surface and I calm myself and I hand my gun to uh, my mate Ash. That's like Ash Bowler, extreme spear fishing, you know. And I hand yeah. my gun to him. And I, like I start, I just, like kind of casually pull myself up the side of the tenny and I'm like, oh, you should see the uh, size of the garfish I just shot. <laughs> <laughs> and we watched their faces, man. It was like their faces, their jaws just all drop and this, this like sailfish just rolls up onto the surface. And yeah, it was, it was that was probably one of my most memorable like fish stories everywhere. Just yeah. everything comes together and all the time and practice and shooting my gun and that just, 
you know, ended up with like my, my the, the target getting stoned and, you know, so yeah, it was, it was, it was a pretty cool day for me. That's a wicked story, yeah. man. Yeah, it was good fun. Yeah. All right, Ant, um, mate, you spoke about a couple of techniques that you used over in the Mediterranean, mate. What is your favourite hunting technique and uh, what fish do you use it on and how do you apply it? Oh, mate, there's, um, mate, I, I love just all aspects of spearfishing. Like, a lot of people don't invite me out on the reef because they're just, oh, mate, we're, we're just going to, like, you know, I live in Cairns now, which has got an awesome reef just offshore and, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, no, we're just going to go swim around the, the bombies and thump trout and stuff. But it's funny, <laughs> I still like doing that as well. Like, they, everyone kind of thinks that I'm like, oh, no, I'm not interested unless you're going to go dive the wrecks or something. And, but, um, no, nah, honestly, and even it does surprise some of my mates. Like, they ask me what I want to do, and I'm like, oh, let's go chase, like, go chase tr- craze and trout in the bombies. And, you know, so I still like doing all that. But the thing that gives me the biggest buzz, buzz is definitely um, – spear and stuff off wrecks like the deep wrecks something about it something like haunting about seeing a boat um sitting on the bottom of the ocean and um you know seeing these these fish that don't normally get hammered too hard just swimming around and yeah that's that's pretty good buzz but um yeah and then, what sorry what are the wrecks what are the wrecks like off there what, what have you got world war Two stuff off um, hey, I'm sure there is there is stuff like that there, but the stuff we mostly see is trawlers. There's a few luxury yachts and that, and then trawlers. Lots of um, lots of trawlers get hooked up on patches of reef, and they're doing it at night time, and all of a sudden they're pulled under. And so most of the stuff I dive is either you know yachts or trawlers. So, but um, like I'm sure I'm sure there is some stuff up there. Like I've definitely dove wrecks where I have no idea what they are. Like there's now just <laughs> yeah, there's just like yeah, yeah. bits of metal kind of half fifty or sixty seen. years old. Yeah, yeah you can't, a lot can't of old tell. Stuff, so. Okay, so you're hunting um, reefs in the uh, sorry wrecks in the deep. Um, what are some do's and don'ts? What have you learned while you've been doing it? Just having a really good crew, and everyone's very familiar with diving with each other and has a lot of confidence um, in each other's ability to as a safety diver is probably the the thing that opens up deep spearfishing um, because in the end you are relying on 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 your buddies around you that you that even that so you can comfortably do those kind of drops, you know. And um, hmm. definitely, definitely some of the uh, the don'ts is have overpowered guns. Like one of the most annoying things is when you see people shoot mono fish down near a wreck. Uh, the the you know or any kind of fish down there, even if it's trout or jack or whatever, they're all pretty good at just going straight into the wreck. And you you know you'll spend the next couple of couple of dives trying to get a fish out of a wreck, which is actually pretty dangerous to do. So. Mm. Uh, you're better off with a, um, a fairly short range gun. Most of the wrecks we're diving up here, the visibility is not amazing anyway. So, um, you know, but uh, and it's the same with all deep spear fishing. It doesn't have to be wrecks. I mean, I still love doing the, the big drops off the front of the reefs out here. And, um, you know, it's, but still, once again, it just comes down to having a really good crew to dive with, you know. So, like, I'm, I'm lucky. I've got some of my, my good mates up here are some of the best, best spearers I know and really good divers. You know, you've got Quinn Smith. He's another instructor and rob uh rob birdo he's he's awesome to dive with these kind of guys just kind of open the door for me to be able to relax and you know it works really well when we're doing you know three of us or four people doing you know drops everyone's make sure you've got heaps of surface time recovery time and and um you know you know you've got a few sets of eyes when you're coming up so it's um makes it safe yeah okay cool yeah. that's pretty good yeah uh, it's, man, it's a buzz it's definitely definitely fun fun diving with these kind of guys yeah really cool fun i like diving on structure too there's a little bit around brisbane where we sort of dive you i mean you've probably done a bit of a bit yourself off off our neck of the woods yep, um, definitely. it's definitely a unique experience so oh cool yeah no brizzy's awesome man like um you guys definitely have some some great spearing it's I also think it's one of the, the toughest places to spear on the East Coast. You've got a lot of a lot of deep structure there and um, some pretty hard fighting fish. You've got a lot of sharks, a lot of current. Um, mm. Yeah, I think I think that that area of the coast is some of the um, the hardest spearing on the East Coast. That's for sure. So yeah, we're, great. we're pretty next level here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really, man, up you guys, you, the... they breed them tough down there. I know the spearers oh, that come yeah. out of Brizzy are pretty pretty hardened guys. So. Oh, uh, they breed them even tougher in Bogabilla where Turbo's from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, just before we move on from that, yeah. so did you say, you say you don't like guys shooting uh, mono shooting line? Is that right? Oh no, that's fine. It's just like when their fish ends up always on the mono. You know, when they overpower their guns, and right. you know, ideally, just get fairly close to a fish. You don't need a big gun. And um, the my my thing that I always try to do is to try to stop the actual spear you know, in the fish, not like a full pass through onto the mono because 
gives you a lot more control of the fish. I mean, realistically, like if you have to shoot and then swim for the surface, you need to make sure that fish stays out of the wreck because like, you know, say if you're, if you're trying to keep a safe surface recovery time and you're diving say 35 meters or whatever, or even it doesn't even matter like 25, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, you know, you're, you're honestly looking at kind of somewhere between maybe six and 12, 15 minutes on the surface for recovery time before you should be able to dive again. Um, yeah, which kind of yeah. means that your mate is going to have to go down and dig out your fish and it's, yep. you know, digging out any fish off any structure, um, is dangerous it just is dangerous i mean you know there's such a good chance of being wrapped up and stuff and um so yeah like my thing is like i really really try and never to ever let a fish get back into the wreck um or onto the reef or whatever always try to get it clear of the clear of the reef as you start you swim back up so that your mate's not having to go down and dig it out for you so so what are you what are you talking here one meter one one yeah standard i, know, I typically roller. dive for 1.1 1. 1. um i've got a 1.1 1. 1 aim right at the moment which i'm i'm loving and um it's a roller. So rollers definitely pack a lot of power, but um, I typically fire it off a single wrap. So a lot of rollers, people will run on double wraps, but you have no control over the fish. And realistically, I'm still shooting the fish from about a meter and a half in front of the gun. So I don't really need a hell of a lot of mono, like, you know, shooting line. So um, I still, like, you know, a lot of these fish are pretty big. Like a big jack's pretty good at stopping a spear. So, um, mm, uh, you know, so definitely. yeah, one, a little roller still was, has enough punch, but um you know, I just don't run double wraps so I can straight away pull the fish out of the wreck or the reef or whatever I'm in. So it um, gives me some control over the fish straight away. Yeah, I like that myself. Not that I'm going to 30 metres, but definitely when they're double wrapped, they, they're oh, trying. Okay. Uh, you'll, you'll be going to 30 metres, so I'll be giving you a couple of weight belts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talking about that, next next part of the show, toughest situation. What's the what's the scariest situation you've had out in the ocean and what did you what did you sort of learn from it? Um, mate, uh, probably the scariest, um, few minutes of my diving has been, um, oh man, it's pr probably the one for me is that once I kind of got misplaced at sea and, um, <laughs> and that was, that was pretty scary. It wasn't particularly a long time considering like, you know, some of the stories I hear and that, but, um, uh, like it was probably like half an hour or so. And, but we were like probably 10 Ks offshore out of the banks and um wow yeah so it's you know it's a good current out there it's pretty unforgiving out that way and uh uh it was this kind of uh there was quite a few of us in the water and there's a lot of people i haven't dived with before and um big school of kingies come through and you know, we weren't working as a team as a team at all and everybody kind of just dived in all different directions and shot kingies all over the place and <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was mayhem for a few minutes. Just kept, you know, fish running everywhere, and anyway, and like I think me not wanting to be left out, I probably instead of probably being a teammate that I should have been for other guys, even though I didn't really know these guys, I probably should have just hung by them and just you know waited for next drift. But I kind of went following the school, and um, yeah, like ended up shooting a pretty good fish. He dragged me around for a while, but by the end of the fight, the boat had started picking up other people, but he hadn't found me. And yeah. um, it was actually two of us that got misplaced at the same time, and obviously they're looking for the other guy first. A little bit more important, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Ant will be all right. Ant will yeah. be all right. We'll get the other bloke. He's a whip. Oh man, and um, yeah, it's kind of now I'm sitting there. I don't know. Like you know, the drops off. I was definitely wasn't on the top of the reef anymore, and sitting there with a big kingy in my hands, and um, watching this boat probably about one and a half k's away, looking for me, and uh, I was you know after about 20 minutes i'm like okay well i can't really sit here any longer i'm gonna get you know you know just have to do something so i was thinking okay ditch the fish start swimming for sure and um you know trying to make that decision while you're 10ks out you know in a, in a not a not a two of currents a pretty big decision because like you think if you stay at least in in that actual the drift that you're on they'll at least track you down and which yeah, en yeah. ended up being what happened they kind of they, i think they threw another diver in the water to see which way he was drifting exactly and then they like it was like it was one of those most relieving moments ever. I was starting to really fret and I had my float on top of my gun. So I had a big, big yellow float. And that's something I I make sure I really kind of stress in all my teaching is be highly visible, you know, really, really visible if you're floating gear because you know, a lot of us were in camouflage wetsuits, diving in like, you know, a meter of sea or whatever, you're invisible, man. So yeah, be yeah, highly yeah. visible in everything you do. So make sure you have big colored, big bright colored floats and and I put that up on top of my gun and um, eventually that's what they spotted. And, yeah, it must have been like kind of 40-something minutes in the water if they came over and grabbed me, which is, you know, 
big relief. And um, wow, yeah. So you know that that kind of stuff. You know, you you learn for experience, and now I'm much more cautious about the um, the situations I get in, and also the keeping an eye on everyone around me, just because you know you do. It's easy to get misplaced out there. So. No, it's a good one. That was a, yeah, good story, good takeaways too. Um, and awesome. <music> Guys, head on over to penetratorfins.com. They are proud sponsors of today's Noob Spiro podcast. We're happy to announce a code you can use to save yourself $20 on any blade purchase. That's right, save $20, pump in the code Noob Spiro, check out penetratorfins.com, save yourself some dough on some fins and get yourself some of the best fins going with $25 flat rate international shipping and a full international warranty. Larry's the man. Thanks, Penetrator. Hey guys, today's Veterans Vault is brought to you by our ebook, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. It's actionable information from more than 40 interviews with spearfishing experts from around the world. Turbo, what do you like about the book, buddy? Mate, I love it that it's called 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing, but there's well over 99 tips in there. Some estimated at around 1,000 or 1,500 tips. <laughs> <laughs> I love your estimation. I like the fact that it's just actionable information to, to improve your spearfishing out of sight on the next dive. Yep, absolutely. It's the best value for money spearfishing book on the market. So get on Amazon.com and pick yourself up a copy. 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Thanks, guys. All right, and now it's time for our section of the show, The Veterans Vault, where um, you talk about your area of expertise. I believe we're talking about spearfishing training in the pool. Yeah, well, look, that's um, that's been something I've been really enjoying. And even, like, I moved up to Cairns about a year and a half ago and uh, set up a really big squad up here. And, man, it's just it's just awesome to watch watch these guys. I mean, up here, I think the guys are pretty spoilt for quality fish in shallow water and... Um, so watching these guys kind of, they really, it, you know, we also got amazing fish in deep water up here and watching these guys kind of really go through the whole program, you know, learn to, you know, go do a course, you know, then they come to training. One of the biggest things, a lot of guys do courses and they don't really have anywhere to get out and train that stuff. Yeah. And, yep. you know, and some people aren't, aren't really into pool training, but, um, man, there's, there's something about pool training is you get to focus on actual training, not spearfishing, yeah. you know, while you're spearfishing, you're focused on other stuff, but you're not tr- you're not trying to train the small intricate things that you should be focusing on. You know, like your technique, yeah. streamlining that kind of stuff. So yeah. you know, when once you yeah once you see people, the improvements they make in the pool. Um, you know, I'm not saying these improvements go straight away out into the ocean. You know, whatever you're doing in the pool, you can do in the ocean. It's not like that at all. I mean, the way I teach is I train at a real high tempo in the pool. I kind of get people you know diving or doing like 90 something percent swims in the pool. But what that does is it lifts their 50% when they're out spearfishing. And that's kind of what I tell people to do is spearfish at around about 50% of what your ability is. So it gives you this huge window of safety, you know. And But in training, you go crazy, man. Like as long as you've got a really good network set up around you, I mean, I'm I'm – I'm pretty much on these ones on the squad I have. I, I actually run it as a training squad where I don't I don't train. I sit there and watch and coach and um, you know. So these guys can go as hard as they want and uh, actually get some adaption to low oxygen or hypoxia, whatever you want. And um, but also you know make sure I coach them on technique and how to recover properly from between their dives, breathing techniques, that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's awesome. I think it's, you know, when a lot of other guys are sitting there watching Home and Away, you get the, <laughs> the, the hard guys in the pool, man, doing laps. And Yeah, it's one thing I got out of it. Um, I mean, I've done the Stage A and I've also done your dad. Your dad runs ran the program as sort of like an eight-week thing. Yep. And we, we met half our dive crew through there and this the progressive week-on-week week, um, sort of improvements you make are really um, gratifying and 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 sort of tangible and you and you can feel and understand your body to such a such a greater extent extent because you're doing it over a longer period of time Uh, like courses are great but uh, like extended training just seems to make it um, even more difference. Oh, I found. Mate, hundred percent. Like I, I honestly, I mean, obviously, I'm a free diving instructor. Um, I definitely recommend courses, but you know, courses is pretty much a cramming. You get a lot of information in two days or three days or whatever the program is. But I always tell people the best stuff about a course happens in the next couple of months after the course, without a doubt, you know, where you actually get to put all that stuff into practice and start thinking about it, start training it, and all of a sudden it just comes together, you know. So 
One thing um, that we really worked on pretty hard in uh, the course we did with your dad here at the Brisbane Bull Sharks, uh, well, it's called the Bull Sharks now, but um, was we, we videoed um, our finning. Yep. And Wayne gave everyone sort of like a critique of their finning technique. And uh, it's something I think probably listeners can even replicate, you know, even if they don't have a formal um, training program of their own, yep. they could go down to the swimming pool with their own buddies and video it. Is there any sort of, um, you know, further advice you'd give oh, like, yeah. with things like that? Mate, 100%. Like that's that's where I see the biggest improvement come in people's diving. It's a lot of people think we're going to teach them this magical breathe up and stuff. And we definitely teach some breathing techniques, there's no doubt. But I see the biggest improvement uh, coming from is technique 100% of the time. And um, the obviously the biggest thing is your finning technique and streamlining. And to give you a kind of an idea of what I look at is um, to get an, imp- uh, an actual increase in pace in the water, if you want to get a 10% increase in pace with power, it takes you around about a 30% increase in power. So you have to kick, kick a lot harder to kind of move through the water. But if you want to get the same results, you know, around about a 10% um, increase in pace, you only need to reduce your um, drag by 10%. So if you work on streamlining and you can reduce your drag by 10%, you get a 10% increase in pace. So, wow. yeah, it, wow. it's it's like black and white, man. Good technique, head position in the water. And one of the other things I work on is your finning technique. If you can be keeping your leg strokes and your, you know, pretty much your leg strokes definitely inside your kind of silhouette of your body, your legs aren't going to be producing a lot of drag. If you're bending at the knees, obviously this is a pretty common one, um, bending at the knees and, you know, specifically if you have a really stiff fin, a lot of people still think stiff fins are the way to go and um, definitely not of that world. Um, if you've got a stiff yeah. fin where you need to bend your knees to actually get a nice arc through that fin, um, well, your knee is actually creating a lot of drag. And, you, you know, once again, going back to that theory, you're having to put more power in through your legs to get the speed or the movement in the water as opposed to just reducing drag. It's, I mean, for me, it's like you don't have, you just crunch the numbers and, yeah, and just a reduction of drag slightly is what's going to give you the biggest distance or most economy is what we're really after. So Okay, cool. Yeah. So with, with, with finning technique, you talked about um, the, the knee bend and you identified – you know, guys having fin blades that are too stiff because they think they have to overpower them. Yep. Well, uh, do, you, do you find that uh, it's f- foot pockets as well play a part in that? Mate, 100%. Um, one of the, the biggest misconceptions out there is that the blade is the whole part of the fin and everyone goes and spends a lot of money and just gets, you know, um, awesome blades. And look, I'm definitely for that. There's there's no doubt about it. I mean, I'm definitely rocking carbon blades and um, there is, like, in my point of view, like, there is just no compromise in that. It's like it's good but if you look at these guys they rock in hard blades and then they go and get a, a foot pocket that doesn't match that blade like a soft foot pocket uh, well then they go to kick that blade they're getting an arc through their foot pocket and rubber rubber is an awesome dampener of power you know you you use rubber to soften the impacts and take out stress and vibration you know so yep. you have the space age technology attached to rubber um well you <laughs> yeah. know well, well, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see what happens there. But um, and it goes in reverse as well. A lot of people go and they buy these beautiful carbon composite or whatever blades and uh, attach them to rock hard foot pockets, you know, and uh, that you'll see straight away that the blade bends from the end of the tendons and not all the way up to the toes, which is what you want. You want the blade pretty much bending under your foot just ever so slightly, not your, you know, you don't want to be losing all the power through your foot pocket, but pretty much starting at your toe and bending from there, getting a nice curve is what you want the blade to like you to do but if you have thick rubber or hard stiff rubber foot pockets well then that's going to be a problem you know so you're going to lose half of that half of that part of the reason i know about this is from wayne like i ran hard fiberglass blades and and uh i had stingray foot pockets which are okay but they were a size too big yep and uh i went to (laughs) (laughs) i went to carbon fiber (laughs) mediums uh penetrator and and he put me in mario's pockets and uh i I, I find, like, I don't know, maybe like five times as better. I don't oh, get fatigue mate. in my legs and my technique heaps better uh, just without yeah. even doing anything. Mate, I, that's that's a pretty common one that I recommend to people is, or oh, one is just a good quality carbon fin. Um, you know, it's definitely getting a fin matched for your weight as well. I mean, you know, like, yeah. give you an idea, is like I'm about 90 kilos, but I still rock a soft fin. So, um, yeah. 
but you know, for me, that's what I find is matched to my weight. I mean, like I customize my own fins, right? Like I custom make carbon fins. So for me, it's not a not a big deal. I kind of just make a fin to suit my body weight and how I how I kick. So, um, but yeah, getting those Mara's, uh, those razor foot pockets, they're they're awesome. They have a really really soft tendon, so you get a lot of movement through the the, the top part of the blade. Yeah. Um, yeah, and matching those with a set of penetrators, yeah, yeah, great great setup for especially for a dude. So yeah, yeah. I'm 124 kilo, so that's probably why I'm rocking medium yeah well that would, that would that would explain it yep it's, it's all it's all muscle though it's a <laughs> <laughs> solid package yep. yeah like i'm, I'm yeah. 70 kilos i had to go i had to go to the gym and beef up my pins yeah I was, gonna, <laughs> I was gonna talk about that like levi used to suffer from a lot of um like foot and leg cramp and he suffered with and, power uh, multiple yeah, days and my ankles like and wayne showed me my ankles would roll and i'd s- spill water off the blade yeah man, real common and problem so, super common yeah problem. yeah so yeah in the gym doing heaps of work with that and it's, it's coming good yeah look typically um it happens when like one of the things is i think a lot of blades on the market are too wide for a lot of people um, you know, it's something that's real easy if you just kind of, if you lay down on your back and just get comfortable, put your kind of, you know, your legs in a comfortable position and then point your toes and then just have a look at where your po- your toes are pointing. And if you imagine, you know, what are your, what are a set of, you know, not normal length blades nowadays, like 800 long or so, you know, so they're, they're pretty, they're pretty long. You just look at how much how big that is and how much of the your blades are going to clip each other and then the other thing is how much leverage those blades have on your foot you know it's huge so and that's where you get that spill from you know so a lot of the a lot of the guys especially you know a lot of the dudes kind of 70 you know 80 kilos like i tell them to look at a more of a narrow blade something around about the um 180 mil, 190 mil wide, you know, something like the black tech seems to be around about that width. You know, okay. That way in the, the blade's not applying so much leverage to their ankles, you know, where, you know, a guy that's 6'2", six, 6'3", six, whatever, and 100 kilos, man, you could rock out a hard dive R or, you know, penetrator, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter what brand and probably only get a minimum amount of spill, but still even like for me, I'm 90 kilos and I find anything more than a medium fin, I, like, I mean, I'm not training pretty hard. I still see that your blade gets a lot of spill and loses a lot of its power. So there's no use having such a hard blade if you're, if you're spilling power off the side. So might as well back down to a softer blade and you try to get more out of the blade. So Cool. We're really um, interesting chatting about that. Yeah, it's, um, it's all about economy, mate. That's the way I look at it. I mean, you know, coming from – like I think I've, I've been really lucky. I've walked both paths from competitive freediving to, you know, a lot of recreational spearfishing and, um, you know, watching – Watching how the the correlation between the two sports, I mean, there's some things that change over perfectly, but in most cases, they they are quite different, you know. And but inevitably, it comes down to one factor, and that water produces, you know, so much resistance that you need to be always thinking of economy. That's that's the biggest thing. Yeah, cool. All right, and yeah, like you're saying, pool training is perfect for working out some of these issues and uh even waiting waiting was like something you learn about like if if you've got like quarter of a kilo on too much in the swimming pool yeah or, or, makes a big or, difference. or the other way yeah, yeah yeah and yeah it's it's like and and competitive freediving in the swimming pool teaches you that oh mate it's it's down to the gram and the and competitive freediving you want to be so perfectly neutrally buoyant um you know like i even i even i like, it's amazing what you see when you're really, you know, you, when you're crunching the ones and two percents, it's amazing what detail you go into, you know, like I now allow for how much bubbles are going to come out of my like tri suit as I'm swimming distance in the pool. I just know that <laughs> at the beginning of the swim, I'm going to have more air in my wetsuit than at the end of the swim. So typically slightly more buoyant at the beginning of the swim than I am at the end of the swim. So, you know, I'm allowing for that, but you know, spearing. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. And you do crunch those ones and twos, but, um, you know, you got so much other, so many other factors of drag that you're, you know, you got a, a rig rope or whatever you're sporting, and guns, and you know, yeah. you got knives all over your belt, and you know, whatever else that people are, you know, strapping to themselves nowadays. So I think that's the good thing about it too, though. Like you know, there was something we learned doing it is like, um, you know, competitive freediving, you get right down into the nitty gritty. The Spiros, we don't even pay attention to some of the big macro things like basic streamlining, yeah, basic finning it. technique. And a freediving instructor can definitely help you dial in and, and that, that'll improve your bottom time more than learning any super breathing technique. Oh, mate, 100%. Like there's, look, they're definitely, um, 
work in unison together. That you know, awesome breathing techniques is great. I mean, I, I coach a lot of people on breathing now and seeing awesome results from just teaching people how to breathe properly, which is kind of cool. But for the average Spiro man, if you just focus on economy. Um, and yeah, definitely the, there's a few things that make a big percentage of your dive time, you know, like kind of like I have this workshop angled at Spearfisherman and I kind of, um, how I kind of structure it is I just try to reduce, uh, 10 things, maybe improve them by one or 2%, but 10, 10 things, right. Around about now, if you think about that, if you can, you know, have 10 things that you only do one or 2% and let's just say it's 2%. Well, there's a chance that you're going to have a 20% improvement. Now, a 20% improvement over anyone's downtime is pretty good, you know. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's only just going off the ones and two percents, you know, small things, technique, head position, correct weighting off the surface, recovery times, uh, your gear, you know, and even your volume of your mask. You know, a lot of you guys still rocking huge masks. Um, nowadays, the you can get these low-volume masks that have monstrous vision, and the amount of air you have to put into a mask is so small, you know, so like with these new ones. So it's kind of those things add up, you know, maybe not one thing, but when you've got 10 things like that, yeah, it's it's a big, big difference in someone's downtime. So Cool, cool. All right, well, let's wrap up the veteran's fault. Um, I just wondered if you had any more sort of parting tips for guys that are maybe they don't have access to a pool training squad or something like that, they want to just start doing it with their mates. Any parting tips for guys just doing a DIY? Ah. Uh... Mate, it's it's a real tough one, and like I know it gets stressed on on this, and like I guess it's also my job, so I'm definitely going to say it is go and learn from someone that you want to do that what they're doing. You know, like uh, there's there's like heaps of good instructors out there, there's plenty of them, and if you've got a weakness and or you know you want to fix up or dive better or whatever, go and find someone that does what you want to do. You know, and um, you know like there's there's definitely lots of different teaching methods and that like like I, I have to say man go and do a course like not just for your safety or you know you guys have done it obviously but you know for the listeners out there do a course because the what you're going to learn is not just about your diving it's about everyone that dives with you and even the whole diving community you know and where yeah. where you're gonna you're gonna be a safer diver yourself you're gonna be an awesome dive buddy uh you, you know hopefully you never have to use the stuff that you learn on your course but without a doubt it's happening more and more these days where there's tragedies in our sport. And, um, man, I just say do it the right way, pay to do a course, learn how to be an awesome dive buddy and dive safely yourself. Um, and yeah, man, just trying to keep, keep it safe. You know, like we just can't, the sport can't afford to lose any more people. So, um, oh, perfect. Eh? Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I want to stress. I mean, I even, no, that's a good message. Yeah. Perfect. One yeah. of the, one of the things we've seen this week is, um, you know, a local guy up here and really, really a guy that everyone's very fond of. And I'm sure you guys have heard about it was, was hit by a shark. And it's when you see it so close to home, I mean, he was diving with one of someone I'd call a really good friend and, um, you know, like seeing the impact that it has on the community. Uh, it's kind of, you know, definitely devastating and, you know, like he survived it, but it's still, still, you know, when you see that kind of stuff happening, it kind of freaks you out. So, kind of, yeah, I say go and learn. Like, as a, as a, do, join a club, get your club to do all first aid uh, training, advanced resuscitation, become oxygen administrator, get, make your, make sure you're the safest you can be in the water and for your dive buddies as well. Man, make sure you're sporting a first aid kit on your boat. That's, those are the messages I really want to get out at the moment. It's just, you know, get, be safe, man. Be really, really safe. And, you know, like there's no fish worth and, you know, like ego evaporates or dissolves super quick in water, man. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, there's a lot of things that dissolve in water and, but yeah, yeah. ego is one of them. So, um, awesome. yeah, you know, that's what I want to kind of stress to the listeners is be safe. God bless America, guys. We're joined by Spearing Magazine today. Isn't that right, Turbo? Absolutely. You've done it again. USA. USA. <laughs> God bless America. Now, if you love America and you love spearfishing, get hold of Spearing Magazine at spearingmagazine.com. Hoorah. That's all the American stuff I Semper know. Semper Fi. Chevrolet. <laughs> Detroit City. <laughs> Look, guys, the magazine is way better than Turbo's American accent. Probably better than mine, too. You can um, check out check them out on social media actually head along facebook or instagram youtube whatever's your thing find sparing magazine and join those folks they they put up some wicked photos and stories check them out sparingmagazine.com if you like McEwan's lager 
and we jammy judges. <laughs> <laughs> then Staunch Industries is for you. <laughs> That's right. A barrel for real men. <laughs> Get that up, you cult. Staunchindustries.com. All right, next part of the show, and on to a lighter note. Cool. Uh, the funniest thing. What's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? Oh, man. Obviously, <laughs> like, you know, you, you're in the water for long times. So you get to see some really cool stuff, some really hilarious stuff. Man, I want to tell you guys a story, and it happened to my dad. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Love a good Wayne, Jay. Oh, yeah. And one of my best mates, Mike, Mike Benici, um, man, he, he, this was like just this classic rookie era and it's just like the way it came about was just unreal but we were diving the spot together and um like we were doing a lot of diving together my dad mike and i and um this spot was pretty deep a lot of a lot of people know what i'm talking about at the moment i say it's off foster and uh we're no longer allowed to spirit but um it used to be awesome spot for big Jew and big kings and and um we're out there one day and i do this drop and um yeah like kind of what i what i was what i was doing is mike at the time was pretty pretty confident that he was diving the 20 meters but the top of it was around about 26 27 meters and kind of where the gutter where the Jew and kings were hanging out was about that and so mike didn't really have the downtime at the at that time to, to spend down there to get the kings to swim to him yeah and um so what i would do the kings are very curious i would dive down there and make a bit of a noise rattle around a bit and the kings would um would come over and have a look and Mike would dive down from above and pretty much just snot one in the head that was swimming over to have a look at me, right? It was, it was a pretty cool plan. It was working pretty well, right? Anyway, uh, it was one day. There was, was a lot of things that happened in a very short space of time, but I ended up shooting one Dewey, oh, I was double header on a Dewey and um, uh, stoned one of them, but which, which actually didn't stay on my spear. And the, uh, the other one I did land, I was swimming up to the surface and like Mike's gotten down there at the same time. It's, it's, he's maxing out his kind of like his dive ability. He's getting down to 20 something meters and plunks like plugs his first big Kingy that he's shot for a while and um, pretty much just ditches his gear and just starts legging back to the surface. Now, <laughs> my dad had been down there and uh, like as I hit the surface, I'm yelling at him and going, oh, man, there's Jew down there. There's lots of Jew and I just broke one off. Go, go, go. And so my dad just launches it and starts diving down there. Mike hits the surface and catches his breath, looks around for this rig rope going crazy, thinking he just got a big king in, sees this rig rope, grabs it, and I'm watching Mike get pulled off the surface and he's fighting his first big kingy and, and he's pulling hard and he's like looking at me going, woo, woo, you know, and he's pulling it up, pulling it up. Little does he know, he's actually grabbed my dad's rig rope. <laughs> and he's pulling my dad up off the bottom. My dad's lining up a Dewey and next to me he's been pulled backwards through the water and he's pulling hard against it, trying to like give himself a bit, a bit more room so he can shoot this fish. <laughs> At the same time, Mike thinks he's having an all-out battle against this giant kingfish. Uh, Man, when my dad came out of the murk and Benici's pulling up my dad, my dad's just looking at him, like shaking his head, going, what? Uh, and I'm looking at him going, what's happening here? And I just see Benici just look look over at those other rig rafts about 10 metres away doing circles. And he just, oh, <laughs> swims over, grabs that one. My dad hits the surface and goes, what, the, what, what are you doing? And Mike just says, "Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to." And, oh man, we all just we all just started dying laughing when we saw what actually happened. And like, uh, even that was gallop. like 10, 10 years ago, and we still every time we're kind of together, that story ends up coming uh, out, and we all just die laughing. Man, it was hilarious. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. But uh, yeah, I think that was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in the ocean. And that was that was just hilarious. <laughs> we'll have to try that on. It reminds me actually. I'll tell a story. I'll tell you a story. Yeah. 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 La, la, la. <laughs> this one still pisses me off. Last year I was diving with Turbo, <laughs> oh, and we were having one of those days where every time our float got tangled. Oh, you are <laughs> fucked. Honestly, uh, this guy does zigzags uh, over your rig Every line. time oh. we dive, we got a float, a float battle. And, you know, someone's got to swim over oh, yeah. and untangle the frings. Nah. Anyways, and we're diving through these artificial, <laughs> this artificial reef, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the bottom, and I'm lined up on my first cobia. Never shot a cobia. I'm it's about good. 15 kilo, and it's like six metres in front of me, and I had about comfortable i wanted a good four meter shot i had two meters to swim yeah so and i'm just easing up on this fish and then i feel my float line grab <laughs> i look up at the surface 30 meters behind me 
and there's uh, Turbo's float wrapped around mine. And as if that wasn't enough, the indignity of it, he then proceeds to pull on it, having a, having a tantrum, and he pulls me off this fish. Oh, I'm getting fired up and thinking I'm, about I'm, it. <laughs> I'm fighting him, trying to get that two metres closer to the cobia to shoot my first cobia, and he's pulling me off this fish. I get up the top. And I just spit the dummy. Yeah. He spits the dummy. <laughs> we get on the boat, both of us, and crack the shits. It's a cool and, uh, and he didn't even believe that I had this cobia lined up on the bottom. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, I was fucking. Annoyed. That nearly broke up. The, that nearly broke up the marriage, mate. <laughs> it was nearly all over. That oh, was a huge <laughs> dummy spit. Oh man, so, oh, Matt, I'll, I'll tell you another little one like that. Yeah, um, go for it. It was actually one of the same guys, Benici. Um, when Benici first was getting into spearing, I mean, he um, was not a big fan of sharks, right? And uh, like I have to admit, I'm not either really, but you know, like not when I'm <laughs> not when I'm having a spear around them. But this one day, we're diving, um, diving the spot, and we'd anchored the boat about must have been about 45, 50 meters away from this ledge that we're diving, and um, and it was right next to the side of this little island. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm sitting in the whitewash, drop doing drops through the whitewash into this gutter, and then drop down to this gutter. And as I come through about two meters of whitewash, I go face to face to a pretty good sized bull shark, and um, I bounce off the bull shark. It, it, it gets a good fright too and turns around, goes back down, I go back up through the wash. <laughs> the moment you're in the wash and you can't see the bull shark, you kind of start fretting, oh, yeah. right? And um, yeah. <laughs> and I just turned to turned to him and I just told him, like, oh, hey, man, I just saw a pretty good bull shark. And um, he's like, man, calm ass. I could not believe how calm he was and it just calmed me down completely, right? He just goes, oh, okay, sweet. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, he took that well. <laughs> but, but all I knew was I was only a few meters away from this, this the island, and I'm like, well, I'm pretty safe here. I can pretty much just climb up the rock anyway if the, you know, the shark does decide to buzz us again. And and um, next minute, I'm being towed backwards out of the wash, right out into the into the gutter. And uh, Mike's decided that he didn't like the bull shark idea after all, and he's gone for the boat. But our floats have been crossed up. And now he's pulling me from where I feel safe. <laughs> and he's only about 10 metres away from the boat where he feels safe, but he's in the middle of blue water, right? And he's, he's not, not happy about it. And we're, we both put our head up, look at each other, and I just shake my head, nah, I'm not moving. And he, he gives it another really, really good tug on the rig row, going, Come, I'm going. And I'm like, nah, I'm not moving. And we both put our head down and start powering again. And I'm like, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to hang on to the rocks and he's trying to make the boat. And in the end, we both just give up and just start diving again. He swims back over and, you know, we give up. But, oh, man, that was one of those ones where we both felt a little bit threatened and I know that we both couldn't see this bull shark and he's only a metres away from safety. I'm metres away from safety. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, it was back in the day, that's for sure. And, you know, but, yeah. yeah, good fun. <laughs> he sounds like a bit of a laugh. Oh, no, he was awesome to dive with. He's he's a mad keen fisher now, and you know you don't see too many people go back. But I mean, he's I mean, he's gone like as a weapon as a fisher. Like he caught a hundred and one kilo doggy uh, last year and online, oh, wow. which you know Spiro's dream and obviously a fisherman's dream as well. But you yeah. know, fully sponsored now, like Shimano or Evinrude and all all the all the big big names. He's he's killing it. But yeah, he, he says a lot of it comes down to his spearing knowledge. When you jump in the water and you, you see the how the fish are acting and where they're where they're spooling, like schooling up, it's kind of given him a bit of an insight to the world of the, the world of fishing. So sometimes it's amazing chatting with line fishermen, even with the ones that haven't had diving experience. They seem to know so much about fish that we just we just oh, ignore. Mate, I tell you, we so many people miss the small parts. You know, like mm. when you don't get to see the fish yourself and you have to watch sounder. All of a sudden, it becomes it becomes about which way the current's going, where the bait fish are, what the sounder looks like, all the yeah, stuff yeah. that we don't really care. Like typically Spiros have their spots and we just have a mark, we just drive out there, jump in. We don't really even care, <laughs> care what the current's doing, where yeah. the current makes a monstrous difference, you know. So uh, like last year I, I, I wrote a course and pretty much because, you know, free diving courses are awesome, of course, but um, there's so many people entering the spearfishing world that um, – don't really have any of this knowledge of where to find the fish. And the first couple of years of spearing are pretty hard on people, you know, like, you know, you don't know what gear to get. You don't know how it's supposed to work. You don't know where to find the fish. You have no free diving technique at all. So that kind of, this, this kind of workshop I put together was angled at those guys to kind of just give them a bit of an insight of how to find fish, you know, and just kind of streamline the first year of their spearing or year or two of spearing just so they can, they know where to look, what to look for, what fish need. I mean, fish are like, like any, they need, um, you know, a few basic things, some kind of obviously food, current, some water movement and um, some kind of cover unless it's obviously blue water fish. But, 
you know, yeah. and, you know, so many people, we, we, you know, the current changes from north to south, we still jump off that north end of the reef going, yep, here we are. But yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah. current's <laughs> the complete other end, all the fish are down there that day. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can learn, ah, cool. you can learn a lot from uh, from a good fish our way. That's that's for sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next part of the show: dive bag. So, what's yeah. in your dive bag? And head to toe, what equipment are you using? You've already mentioned your Aimrite One One Roller. Keep in mind, he's he's up in North Queensland, so he's in the warm water. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, look, man, and I my gun bag's packed behind me, and I'm flying to Sydney tonight, and um, going up to the mid north coast of New South Wales, chasing uh, cobes and Jews. So. Um, you know, like I do definitely do my time in cold water, but um, up here, man, like it's the water temperature is like 30 degrees at the moment. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so hot. It's not funny. And um, yeah. like I, I've taken a while to switch to Lycra. Everyone's in Lycra up here, and uh, which is cool. Like now there's it's just freedom, isn't it? Oh, just getting mate. into Lycra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turbo loves it. Yeah. It's all for them. We're in the studio, but. <laughs> oh, mate, it leaves absolutely nothing to the imagination, which is um, yeah. a big part of it, I think. And um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, there's a few companies making awesome lycras now. They like got the you know Salvi Mar and Aim Right lycra suits, and uh, pretty much everyone's rocking them up here now. And um, you know, which is good. You don't you only need to have like one weight on. See, I'm still diving in like a three mil wetsuit, but though it's pretty crushed three mil and got a few good holes in it. Um, you know, it's, that's pretty much what I'm rocking. But um, man. Honestly, the the things I look at is, um, you know, I try to streamline all my gear. Uh, my mask is uh, either use one of those Salviumar Noah mask or the Technosub Micro. Um, yep. There, like that Technosub Micro mask is a ridiculous mask. It is so good, it's not funny. Uh, if it fits your face, anyway, there's a lot of people that doesn't fit well. But that's the mask. I've done my deepest dives in my spearfishing gear. Like I've clocked 90 meters in bifins with that mask on, so which is like bringing back old wow. school a bit. And yeah. um, to have a mask down at 90 meters is um, is a is a pretty pretty good feat, you know. So um, yeah, that that mask I I say is the bomb. Um, yeah, then uh, man, I'm rocking uh, Salvi Mar suits at the moment. Um, Okay. Yeah, it's kind of making sure for Spiros, you should have two knives on your body. I've got one on my belt which uh, and one on my arm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What knives do you use? Just I got one of the, I use one of those Rob Allen sheaths on my arm because they're super low volume, kind of a low, you know, st- very streamlined knife sheaths. So I've got yep. one of those. And uh, whichever knife kind of fits it, you know, if it drops out, I just replace it. I, it doesn't need to be an expensive knife, but. Um, uh, then on my belt, I've got one of those Salvi, uh, Salvi Mar, kind of about a three and a half or three inch um, sil- uh, sil- stiletto, which is an um, awesome kill knife. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the knives. But yeah, Spiro should carry two knives. And um, and yeah, I, like I said before, I, I rock my own carbon fins. I make carbon fins and, um, you yeah, know, like that's, I, I mean, I love them. I'm uh, the, kind of so picky when it comes to fins now just because, you know, you just you just get spoiled, I think, when you design a fin for your own body weight. Um, yep. well, I kind of crossed over. I designed those for my first set and my dad stole them. He's rocking my, my first <laughs> set that I um, kind of brought all the way through to being finished. But now I make, I make a few sets now for my mates. And, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, man, um, the next thing is dive computer A. Um, I think a dive computer is one of the best tools. There's so many variables in the ocean and there's only a few things that you can have on you that take those variables out and a really good dive computer is one of them. So, Okay, you got any brands you recommend? Um, mate, I've always used Santo. Uh, my Santo, uh, I've had a Santo D4 for years now and um, – but yeah, like my one's my one's pretty much just given up the ghost. I mean, honestly, it's it was the first D4 in Australia, pretty much, and it's um it it's clocked a lot of dives, and I'm super hard on my <laughs> gear. Like I'm not I'm not one of these normal free divers that you know, like I've come coming from a super spearfishing background. I punish everything that I get my hands on. So <laughs> for I was even surprised any dive computer lasted that long. Um, you know, and yeah, that that Santo D4 was awesome. And now Santo's released. Um, you know, obviously got D4i and the D4f, the free diving range. But um, yeah. I'm yet to get my hands on one. So if any of you guys from Santo hear this podcast, think of me nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've had the D4i. Um, I think it's called the Novo. That they've had that watch come up a few times on the show with different guests. It it comes highly, highly. Yeah. It's highly regarded anyway. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Honestly, like I said before, it's just one way that you can keep an, a really good track on your actual dive time and recovery. And that's that's one of the biggest things, not just for your own safety, but for um, 
increasing your bottom time. I mean, you're, I've heard it on your show a few few times. People recommend increasing your surface time and recovery intervals is going to increase your bottom time, and without a yeah, doubt, yeah. it does. So, um, yeah. just running a really really comfortable dive profile like that, and honestly, you don't know unless you're wearing a watch. Like mm. I um I wrote a deep spear fishing course oh, it must have been eight years ago, right? And I went and researched, did a lot of my own research on when I feel comfortable to dive again, and how long is that? And um, I was like, yeah, this is good, this is good. Man, I gave myself decompression sickness, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was not cool at all. It kind of was a real unpleasant um, couple of days. I didn't really know what it was. It wasn't really big in the sport of spearfishing no. yet, decompression. Yep. And um, all it was was I was just going on my feeling. I felt fine to dive, so I dove. And, um, wow. yeah, obviously my surface intervals weren't big enough. And, man, I, I struggled for a few weeks, uh, monstrous fatigue and prickly skin. And, you know, it was really, really wow. average. So so now, like, I really keep – I'm very mindful of my surface intervals. And, um, uh, you know, one, just make sure I'm off-gassing if I'm spearfishing deep. and But also you just get more out of each dive. And, you know, if you're, if you're putting in that kind of hard work, um, you need to be rewarded with good fish. If you're doing big dives and there's no fish, <laughs> move somewhere else, you know. So, you know, if you're if you're worried about that 12 minutes on the surface is too long, well, I'd tell you what, there has to be an awesome fish down there for me to do 12, 12 minute surface intervals and, um, <laughs> you know, make it worth that kind of interval, you know, and, but, oh, yeah. you know, when, when it is worth it, yeah, the fish are there and it's, it's worth making sure I've recovered 100% before I dive and mm. the dive computer is, is mate, it's your only tool with that. Don't, don't just go on feeling, which is nice, unless you're really, really familiar because everyone catches their breath and kind of offloads the, the excess carbon dioxide so that they feel nice again in, a, in around about a minute, you know. And um, But we, we recommend, as most instructors would recommend, that a, a minimum of two minutes, doesn't even matter what your bottom time was between dives, is going to see the best dive time. So, um, you know, yeah, get a good watch, man. Even a good watch, like, doesn't have to be a super good dive computer, but something that you can monitor your surface intervals is going to it's going to see people improve their dive. So, cool. I'll link up a few in the show notes. Um, spearfishing.com.au, um, carry the Sunto D4i, and yep. listeners can use our code to save a bit of cash on that. Yes, yeah, sweet. Um, and they, uh, they, they sell a whole lot, a whole range. So, there's a few other ones that are a bit more basic, I think. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, you make a compelling case for it. I've actually left it out of my dive back. Um, um, mostly because I'm a tight ass, <laughs> but uh, I think I, I I might look at it a bit more seriously now. So yeah, that's it. Look, the biggest thing and um, for new guys that I see as well with dive computers is um don't look at them while you're down. Like just you're supposed to be spearfishing. Don't look at your dive computer, man. Look at it when you're on the surface. Kind of evaluate your your dive profile. If you're seriously diving that deep, where you need to look at your watch to tell you how deep you are, um, you probably aren't supposed to be diving. In that kind of range of water so back it down a little bit dive for fun dive for comfort and just use it to keep an eye on your surface interval time that's that's the best thing so they make good um good um things and selfies too oh mate you know. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, i always i g up a lot of guys i see a lot of guys putting um photos of their dive computers next to fish and oh, i always well, go out yeah. of my way to put my dive computer next to a beer you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I make sure it also says about 11 a.m. on my dive computer so they know it's not even an after lunch beer. Um, <laughs> so, and that, that kind of G's up these these guys with the uh, egos, man. I, I don't I don't believe in putting a dive computer next to a fish. I don't really care. I mean, I think the best spearers shoot the shoot the best fish in whatever water they find them in. You see these guys that pull amazing fish out of two meters of water, and those yeah. are the guys I respect a lot because it takes a lot of lot of hunting now to get those fish out of that kind of shallow, heavily hit water. So. Um, yeah, I'd be more likely to brag about that. If I took something amazing out of two meters, I'd be like, ha, look at that. I didn't even leave the surface. 20, <laughs> yeah, year, 20 yeah. years of training and spearfishing and freediving, I didn't even leave the surface. Eat that. I'm a ninja. Know, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, last part of the show, Ant. Well, just a couple of quick questions for you. Yeah. Um, what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given in spearfishing? Oh, mate, that no fish is worth your life. Just relax. Let, let them come to you. Don't chase them. That's yeah, definitely, I mean, for when I was a young uh, diver and man, obviously when you're those young guys who are a little bit more ego driven for a photo with an awesome fish and man, you don't have to be young, you can also be old like me and be still a little bit driven by it, but man, it doesn't really matter. You honestly don't chase it, let them come to you and they will eventually come to you and you'll get that fish when you're supposed to. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was a big one. All right, cool. Who is the best person to go spearfishing with for you right now and why? Oh, mate, I'm always going to say my dad, um, mostly because just like, you know, the, the time we've spent in the water together has just been priceless. Uh, I, I always 
uh, any any opportunity I get to dive from. Though he he does tend to push at both ends of the uh, the the candle. Uh, he does like he. <laughs> there's definitely things that he's more comfortable in the water doing than I am. Like his tolerance of sharks, like taking burly out of his hands and stuff like that, is a little bit more than mine. <laughs> and uh, like you know, I remember once these fish shows came over to us and go, mate, you, is there two or three of you in the water? And Mike's like, oh, yeah, there should be three of us. And he goes, well, there's a guy about a k and a half from here doing a drift and if you you know if you know fish rock at southwest rocks he's doing a drip from fish rock and like there's no landmass until hat head you know like he's doing a <laughs> and he's about a k and a half away and he's mike goes and has to pick him up and he just straight away asked mike for more burly and um you know like, <laughs> he's just he's loose as like there's times where i just sit there and nah, i'm getting out of the water man you can you can have fun by yourself and but no, nah, he's always got my back. I've always had his, um, without a doubt, at any opportunity. He's the guy I'd go diving with if, if you know, we're ever in the same area. 100%. He's, he's awesome to dive with. So, All right, cool. Uh, Last question, Ant. Yeah, mate. Um, during your 20-plus years of spearfishing, what is the single biggest lesson you've learned? Um, and spearfishing is a – or free diving, I should say, in any aspect should be a team sport. It's um, It comes down to the people you have around you. And those are, those are the people that are not only going to make it fun, going to make it safe. So, like, establish a really good team, a really good crew. Don't, don't be afraid to invite some new people and some new guys because they're going to learn good habits from you and you're going to lift the standard of spearfishing um, in your group and in Australia. And uh, those, those are the biggest lessons I've learned is just, man, it's a team sport. You know, even though freediving itself, you know, and obviously I'm pretty heavily involved in competitive freediving still and, is everyone looks at it as a single guy swimming down a rope. That's it's really not the case, man. Yep, I'm on the rope and I'm swimming down, but I got three or four safety divers on the surface watching me and making sure I get back safely. So it is it is still a team sport, and um, it's the same same with, with spearfishing. It's the more you can think of it as a team sport and going out together as a crew and getting good fish uh, as a crew. That's that's going to see um, one is the sport's going to be more accepted in Australia and not just. You know, people out killing. It's 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 about a you know a family almost. You know, so I think that's um, one of the biggest things I've seen that I like to think about. And when I'm diving, awesome, man. It's been uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal having you on the show. Got a ton of good stuff out of uh, today's chat. Um, look, where can where can listeners come and find you? Uh, you've got a Facebook page for your free diving. Yeah, probably the um the best one. If people want to kind of get involved and see what courses I'm running. Um, and not just courses, I run a lot of workshops. I teach people how to hands-free equalize now as well, which is kind of a buzz. Um, you know, but I also teach breathing, breathing courses, not just uh, Spiros, but, you know, any kind of athletes that are interested in learning how to breathe for performance, not just for breath holds. You know, inevitably it gives them bigger breath holds. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah, find me on um, at Freedive Ant Judge on Facebook. And that's, okay. Yeah, and then I'm on my email address, if you want to contact me personally, is Ant Spiro at gmail.com at spiro at gmail.com just scribbling these out yeah i'll include them all in your um show notes so people can come and find them are you on instagram as well yeah i'm free dive instructor that's okay free dive instructor. Free dive instructor. all instagram. right no worries i'll link all that up in the show yeah awesome um, any other parting bit of guidance for our audience oh mate Ant, you or? guys just keep up the good work um man it's it's like once again you guys are also bringing together like a community which is like i think was what spiros really really need is to be part of a community and um, like a group and, and I think any kind of club any kind of facility that brings together some kind of community is doing awesome in spearfishing so yeah you guys are part of that as well so yeah you guys keep up the good work man thanks Ant thanks for being part of our community buddy oh it's been a pleasure absolute pleasure well that concludes today's episode with Ant Judge I hope you learned something there. I hope you consider doing some pool training to improve your free diving for your spearfishing. I know I've done it and it helps out so much. And uh, particularly when you're starting out, it helps out a lot. And uh, it's a great way to meet other spearos that are starting out. So you can um, form those friendships and, and get some good dive partners and some good dive crews happening. So definitely worthwhile. Our next episode is with um, Travis Hogan from Aim Right Australia. Now, Travis is up in Cairns and he gets to dive the uh, beautiful coral sea and the waters up there, the warm waters um, of the northern part of Australia. And he hunts uh, blue water species and a lot of the reef species up there. And uh, he talks to us about seasonal, seasonal blue water hunting and drift diving. Uh, he talks to us about a, his toughest moment was a, a shark attack. 
and um, how they dealt with that. So a very interesting episode to come and we look forward to that one. Now, as always, guys, subscribe to the Floater newsletter and uh, subscribe to us on iTunes as well. And that's about all from me. Stay safe, buddy up, look after your mates, and we'll see you in the water soon. Shrek, you know me, I love to pretend to read. (laughs) And even more than that, I love glossy images. And that's exactly what you get with Spearing Magazine. It's our favourite spearfishing magazine from Jeremy Gamble, uh, our guest on the Noob Spiro podcast. It's an absolute ripper and he's got a great deal for listeners here in Australia. That's right. You can get the whole back catalogue for sixty bucks Australian. If you're if you're down south, if you're down under, and and we'll include the South Africans in that absolutely as well. Love it. You, you can email Jeremy Sales at spearingmagazine.com and secure the whole back catalogue for sixty bucks. Jeremy put this together just to help help us people down here overcome the uh, cost of shipping. So get hold of nineteen issues of this top quality magazine for sixty bucks. And as we all know, every good Spiro needs a good supplier of good equipment. Now, you can find that good equipment at spearfishing.com.au. That's right, our show sponsor, Adreno. Their online store can be found at spearfishing.com.au. And if you use the code NoobSpiro at checkout, you'll save yourself $20 on all purchases over 200 So get online and check those guys out. Shrek, you got a couple of things on your mind. Shalom, Turbo. Yep. I would love it if people would head over to noobspiro.com and sign on to the floater, the floater email newsletter. It's our monthly release that gives you details. Oh, monthly release, the floater. <laughs> so bad. It gives uh, a bit of a quick update on what's happening on the blog and in Noob Spiro's world. And you also get a couple of bonuses when you sign up. You get the dive day checklist and 10 tips to become a better Spiro. you got to get that dive day checklist. It's got a photoshopped image of Shrek on it. We've, we've pulled in his guts a bit, made him, and he's put out his shoulders a bit. We actually paid for that. Mine's hanging over my bed head. I look at it every morning when I get up. you got to get yourself a copy of it. That's the only way I start my day. Thanks for listening and putting up with us today, guys. <laughs> Talk to you in another fortnight. See ya. See ya.